Hey yo, how's it cracking? Looks like you've had a right busy day. That flustered expression on your face. Hey, what's that? You ain't got time for nothing. Well, if you ain't got time for nothing, then you must have time for something. And I reckon that something's a pint. Uh, not wrong, am I? How special is it then? There, get your laughing gear around that. <laughs> Funny thing, isn't it? Time, I mean. Sometimes you never have enough. You squeeze every second out of the day. Like a miser squeezes a penny. But on occasion, it can seem like you're adrift on a sea of hours. I guess that's just the way the scythe swings. Used to know this bloke, actually. Fat Cooper, his name. Obsessed with time, he was. Then again, he were a watchmaker. So he would be, wouldn't he? Used to have a workshop just off High Street. The TikTok shop. Gone now, of course. Like many of the shops on the streets. Casualties of the recession. Not much call for bespoke timepieces during an economic downturn. That said, I don't reckon his art had been in it for a good few years. When I first met him, Back in the 80s, being a somewhat excitable and passionate bloke. But after a strange incident back in June of 1986, that all seemed to change. I just opened up for lunch, and like clockwork, Pat come in with a small brown wooden box under his arm. He ordered a black and tan, usual tipple and went and sat over yonder, uttering barely a word. Strange, I thought, as he were usually quite affable, but I paid it no mind. We all have bad days, after all. Not five minutes later, this gent came in, dressed head to toe in tweed he was, looking quite the lord of the manor. He had a quick scan round, and on spotting Pat, walked over to his table. He took a seat, turned to me, and in a rather oity-toity voice said, Whiskey, double, on the rocks. A right one, I reckon. Anyway, as I was making his drink, I noticed Pat slide the wooden box over to him. He opened it up, Nied the contents curiously. I took the drink over, a courtesy I usually would not have extended. But, nosy parker that I am, I wanted a gander at what were in that box. To be honest, I'm a bit disappointed. We're not but a carriage clock, and a rather plain looking one at that. So I went back behind bar did a bit of titivating. There were a brief exchange between Pat and his tweed clad acquaintance. Then in one quick motion, Tweedy pulls out a fat roll of tens, knocks back his whiskey, picks up the box, gets up and leaves. Brief nod to me on the way like. That's when I heard Pat breathe a long sigh of relief. Good business then, Pat, I shouts over to him. Ah, you could say that. I were about to quiz him, but it was starting to get busy. With all the folk coming in on the lunch break. At 2.30 I called time. Not that there were many in by then. Yet curiously, Pat was still sitting, nursing his pint. Odd that, I thought to myself. 
Pat were usually the one part and get back to work kind of fella. So I says, here, Pat, ain't you got a shop to get back to? Looks up at me, a bit startled. Taking the afternoon off, Jack. Not feeling up to it, mate. Fair dues. But you can't stay here. I'm closing. Oh, is it really that time? Aye. Here, are you alright, Pat? Don't quite seem yourself. It's nothing. Silly, really. Sorry, I'll get myself gone. Well, you know me. Any hint of a good story, and I'm on it like a student on a free meal. Don't sound like nothing, Pat. Here, you stay put. Just let me lock up. What's going on then? Not like you to bunk an afternoon off. Oh, that's stupid, mate. I'm being daft. I'm sure, but right now, being amongst all them time pieces frankly fills me with dread. It's the ticking, see? The damn ticking. Can't get it out of me head. That clock. Ticking. You mean the one you just flogged to that gent? The very same. Picked it up at a car boot sale, Sunday just gone. Should have known better. Dead man's timepiece. Now but trouble. But it were a steel jack. Two bob. Didn't know what they had. What do you mean, dead man's timepiece? Well, got talking to the last running store. Selling off a load of her father-in-law stuff. He passed a year ago. Under strange circumstances. Oh. Really? How strange we're talking. Froze to death. Found him hunched over his mantelpiece. All black with frostbite. Ah. That is a bit off, isn't it? I'll see. Apparently the poor bloke were barely into his fifties. Fighting fit, run marathons and all that. Anyway, weren't really much on a store worth looking at. Mostly all sports gear and that kind of keeping. How that clock find its way into his possession, God only knows. But find its way it did. And in turn, into my greedy little mitts. I knew it for what it was straight away. A quality little Victorian timepiece. Fetch a good price at auction. And I happened to know a few potential buyers. For the sake of two bob, what did I have to lose? Of course, when I got it home, I had to have a tinker. That's when I got the sense that there was something not quite right about it. First thing I noticed was the maker's mark had been altered. To what purpose I shall never know. But even stranger, the inner workings and mechanisms resembled those used specifically within nautical chronometers. If I didn't know any better, I would have thought that for some unfathomable reason, a ship's chronometer had been secreted away in the casings of a parlor carriage clock. But alas, not my mystery to solve. I got on the blower to a couple of my associates, and after a bit of back and forth found a buyer, the man I met earlier. So I put the clock back in its box, left it in my study, and put it to the back of my mind. I'd more or less forgotten about it. Until last night. I know I'm no madman, Jack. If I were, it'd be a comfort. For I would know what I saw 
was naught but the fevered imaginings of an unsound mind. I'd fallen asleep downstairs. I have no doubt I would have remained there had I not been woken by a sudden chill. The room was absolutely Baltic. My breath, it were actually misting in front of me. I know, I know, in June as well. Hasn't exactly been cold, has it? I thought I may have left a window open, so I checked. They were all closed fast, but rather bizarrely I noticed they were starting to frost over. I concluded that I were overly tired and probably just seeing things, so I went up the wooden hills to bed. That's when it happened. The carriage clock began to chime. Strange, I thought. I hadn't remembered winding it, but I paid it no mind and carried on to bed. But the chiming, it didn't stop, carried on and on, seeming to get louder and louder until it were near unbearable. Sold this for a box of monkeys, I thought, and stomped into the study, wrenched open the box lid and... The chiming, it ceased, but suddenly I was acutely aware that I was no longer in my study. I looked around, seemed to be on a ship, in a captain's cabin, frozen beams overhead, everything was frozen, dusted in snow and ice. I looked down at a desk, strewn with cans, half-eaten food. The ship's log lay open. One word caught my eye. Erebus. HMS Erebus. No, this wasn't happening. Wasn't true. How could it be? I stumbled out of the cabin into the frozen bowels of the ship. There were corpses strewn all about, huddled together frozen. Their glassy eyes stared up at me, lifeless, unworthy. Cold flesh twitched, frostbitten fingers grasped. One by one, the crewmen rose to their feet and shambled forward. Sick with terror, I floundered onto the deck. Slipping, sliding, one horse over tit, gazing up into the arctic night, I could see a figure, half formed, some skeletal, drumming, drum, 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 each beat an hammer blow that set the ice to cracking, and then it ceased, and with one fleshless arm, traced a line towards the sea. Go, go, it rasped. And I ran, ran through that land, so wild, so savage, frozen souls, lost forever, hard on me heels. Until finally, I reached the sea. And in defiance of all reason, I dived into that midnight abyss, shards of ice filling my veins, stealing my breath, and darkness took me. I walk on the floor of my study some time after, the carriage clock lying close by, ticking away merrily, tick, tock. Tick, tock, tick, tock. We were never the same after that. All passion for his craft, gone. In the end, I reckon he were happy to see that shot go under. No idea what he's doing now. Seems to just fade into background until one day. Poof, you were gone.
without a word. The carriage clock though, well, that's another story. I happened upon an article a few years back, entitled An Arctic Riddle. The Royal Observatory had acquired a rather familiar sounding timepiece, a Victorian carriage clock. For ten years it had languished in the observatory's clock workshop until in 2009 when a Mr John Betts, the Royal Observatory's senior horologist, decided to inspect the simple looking timepiece. As it transpires, the clock was in fact a converted ship's chronometer. Betts noted that a fake maker's name had been stamped crudely on the clock's face, barely concealing the words, Arnold 294. Why would this was the case, Betts could only surmise. But the greater mystery was what the chronometer was doing lying on his workbench. For you see, the Arnold 294 had been assigned to the HMS Erebus, one of the two lost ships of the doomed Franklin expedition. By all rights, the timepiece should have been lost to history. All very strange, especially considering Pat's rather chilling experience. Stranger still, it took place on the 11th of June, the anniversary of Sir John Franklin's death. Of course, I'm sure there'll be a perfectly rational explanation. Something to do with physics. Probably. But what I will say is this. Spend all your time staring at the clock. Eventually, it's going to start staring back. You know what I mean. So you're having another? All right. Things to do, folk to see. I get you. Time and tide and all that. Well, if you need out, you know where I am. Just ring that there bell. Have a good one. I'll be seeing you.